Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 1, Peace Mom, with guest Cindy Sheehan. Cindy Sheehan is an anti-war activist and an anti-imperialist rabble-rouser. She became politically active after her son, Casey, a soldier, was killed in Iraq in April 2005. She became nationally known in August of that same year after establishing a protest camp near President George W. Bush's ranch in Texas. Hundreds of people participated in the weeks-long action, which was named Camp Casey in honor of her son. During this time, the media nicknamed her Peace Mom. Sheehan has run for office multiple times, but she rejects the U.S.-American political duopoly and is a member of the Peace and Freedom Party. In 2018, she launched the Women's March on the Pentagon, now known just as the March on the Pentagon, which organizes an annual demonstration in Washington, D.C. She's been arrested multiple times. Sheehan has authored eight books, including Dear President Bush, The Obama Files, Chronicles of an Award-Winning War Criminal, and Myth America, Ten Greatest Myths of the Robber Class and the Case for Revolution. She also publishes a blog and produces a podcast called Cindy Sheehan's Soapbox with new content every week. In our conversation, recorded on March 3rd, 2020, we talked about what anti-war means, the futility of electoral politics, the environmental crimes of the U.S. military, how propaganda supports war, and how political organizing is affected by technology and social media. It was a real honor to speak with someone who is so accomplished and who has inspired so many. Thank you so much for coming on my show, Cindy. I really appreciate it. Oh, no worries. Thanks for asking me. I wanted to start off with kind of a basic question, which is how is it that we define what anti-war means? And part Mm -hmm. of the reason I want to ask about defining this term is because I feel like the term has changed meaning or perhaps more accurately lost meaning in the last 20 years. I think that's a really good question. It's, I think, a really good place to start. When I first started after my son was killed, like almost 16 years ago now, I felt like I was anti-war. I felt like Really, my formative years were during the Vietnam War and all the protests against that and, of course, the images and just the the brutality of being assaulted with that all the time. I was not old enough to actually go out and protest, but, you know, I was old enough and smart enough to know what was going on around me. So I became very suspicious of the U.S. government the older I got, and I studied history, too. So I just became suspicious of the U.S. government and its motives. When Casey was killed, we were opposed to him going in the military. We were opposed to the Iraq War. We were even opposed to the Afghanistan War, which is something that, you know, a lot of people were very pro going into Afghanistan. There wasn't much opposition to that because 9-11. So I was not like somebody who was like, oh, I'm going to be only against Republican wars and only be against Democrat wars or whatever. I was basically on principle just against war. And so it's really weird that my son joined the military because he was that same way too. So the way that I think it's changed is that I think war, and this is something I've learned in the last 16 years, I think that war, the wars, are very politicized. So when I first became known after Casey was killed, and this was even before I camped out in Crawford, Texas in August of 2005, between July 4th of 2004, three months exactly from the time Casey was killed until August of 2005, I founded Gold Star Families for Peace. I was traveling the country. The anti-war movement, the energy was really uh, dead. But unfortunately, it turns out 
it was also an election year. So many organizations, for example, um, moveon.org and Daily Coase and Democrats.com, they kind of latched on to me because I was also very against Bush. And so they used my story, my pain, my energy, my resources to be against Iraq because everybody saw it as also being against Bush. I think that when Obama became president, when he escalated from George Bush's two or three wars to seven or eight wars while he was president, ramped up drone bombing, didn't stop torture, didn't end any of George Bush's wars, etc. I could go on and on and on, but we don't have all the time in the world today, right? right. The opposition to wars just tanked. And so during that time period of eight years Obama was president, I really started to see that being anti-war isn't enough because the U.S. has always been at war. If it hasn't been at war for a few years, it's been preparing for war, have the hugest war budget of any other country. I think the next 10 or 12 countries combined, we spend more on offense. I won't say defense because what are we going to defend from? I think we have to really look at imperialism and what that is. And if one is anti-imperialist, that means that you're against all these foreign crimes that the U.S. commits and not just when a certain president. And it's you're active against them even when there's a very popular African-American president that can pronounce nuclear. And in fact, he really expanded the nuclear program and spent a lot of money so-called modernizing it while he was president. And really, anti-war also says that there's no war that's just. And I don't believe that either. I believe that self-defense, I be- I'm in solidarity with people who are fighting against U.S. imperialism. You know, I believe that people who... A struggle against oppression here in the United States and all over the world need to be supported that way. And so being anti-imperialist, I think, kind of encompasses everything, is that we are in solidarity with anti-imperialist liberation struggles all over the world. Did that answer your question or did I kind oh, of go off? No, definitely. That's, <laughs> thank you. Off? Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> That's great. And I think that the widening it out to say anti-imperialism includes a lot more than obviously. One of the things I think that includes is the ongoing wars that are happening within the borders of the United States, you know? Right. Also, when Obama was president, it became especially fashionable to support humanitarian interventions. For example, Gaddafi. They say Gaddafi's killing his own people. We don't want Gaddafi to kill his own people, so we're going to kill tens of thousands of Gaddafi's own people, plus brutally murder him. So um, while Obama was president, Clinton was secretary of state, the term humanitarian intervention became fashionable. And I was talking to Dennis Kucinich once, and he said humanitarian intervention is an oxymoron. Right. And uh, they forced him out of his seat. Mm Mm-hmm. They gerrymandered him out of there, his own party. They haven't had any patience uh, for anyone in their party who has a view, even somewhat, anti-war or anti-imperialist. I actually thought of a a good slogan for the Democrat Party. Okay. We decide so you don't have to. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the story this year for sure. That's really nice. Yeah, I haven't I haven't voted for a Democrat for president since 1992. Clinton was the last time, and, and during his first term, I realized just what a liar he was. And so I, right. I, you know, after that, I was I supported Green Party and other people like that, if I voted at all, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think that another part of imperialism that gets left out that people often don't think about is um, sanctions, of course, mm-hmm. you know. That's like another form of warfare. I just saw an article yesterday that said that uh, one of the reasons why the coronavirus is breaking out in Iran as much as it is, is because they're denied medication there right now that would help them with uh, with right. their outbreak. Right. I saw the same article too. And I also recently learned this astonishing, appalling statistic that over one third of the people in the world are living under U.S. sanctions. Wow. Yeah, that's appalling. That's criminal that's inhumane and you know sanctions was uh, you know something that 
the U.S. has been doing for a long time, but, you know, expanded under Obama, et cetera, and especially under Trump, they're an act of war. In Venezuela, the recent round of sanctions has killed 40,000 people already. That's really a, a terrible, appalling, and just disgusting a fact that people, and this is one thing, if I can go off on another, another tangent, that gets me about the about the Sanders people. Because, yeah, Sanders might be the best Democrat running, but what is that saying, really? Right. And so, to me, it's like people are overlooking either ignorantly or on, intentionally his record on foreign policy because they want free stuff. And, you know, this is something socialists have demanded also is some kind of universal health care, free education and good education from preschool through university, etc., forgiving student loans and all that kind of thing. But the first demand is for an end to U.S. imperialism. And while the U.S. is killing all these people, tens of thousands of people due to sanctions, like you mentioned, or to just open warfare, do we deserve nice things? Do we deserve these things? And that's something that we really need to think about. That's a question that I've written about and asked about by myself before. And I put it in terms of here in the United States, there's a lot of discussion as to how to divide up the pie, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of talk about inequality. And certainly there is a tremendous amount of inequality. And, and when people like, you know, Jeff Bezos, et cetera, have so much money, obviously something's going wrong with the system. And yet the point I like to make is that it's not enough merely to cut that same pie up into different slices, we need to ask, where is the pie coming from? Right. And once we look at where the pie is coming from, well, you know, the US military is being used to control resources around the entire world. You know, that's a subsidy so that we can get these things, so we can get the oil, so that we can get the, the metals that are needed, you know, for the, for the cell phones, you know. And then, and of the, course... And the electric cars. Yeah, oh, and the, like, yeah, the lithium yeah. for the batteries, because obviously yeah. that was part of the um, coup in Bolivia, was the lithium that was found right. down there. So how is it that we're getting this pie together, you know? Well, it's all being done through injustice, through uh, coercion, through force, through murder, through sanctions, through all of this. So we need to reduce the size of that pie, then divvy it up, you know? Right, right. And, and while we're talking about that, we should talk about the fact that like, well, the pie is the size that it is in large part because we committed genocide against some people and took their land and then enslaved a whole nother set of people and used them to create wealth. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, another thing is, is when people say, you know, that they want to go back to after World War II. So let's say between World War II and when Reagan was president, when there was actually a middle class in the United States, they don't look at why we had a middle class. That coincidentally, between World War II and, and today is like the rise of the CIA, the deep state, assassinations. And these leaders were assassinated because they dared to think that they could keep the pie for their own country. Right. 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 <laughs> and so they were either assassinated or removed from power. And so our middle class prosperity was off the backs of the rest of the people of the world. And now all these chickens are coming home to roost and voting for a Democrat or a Republican is not addressing these chickens. It's just letting them spread and spread and spread and spread. So, you know, a true socialist would be pro-liberation struggles. And like you said, looking at where is all this wealth coming from? And is it just, is it clean? You know, you look at all these great fortunes and, you know, especially the ones that are generational and they're dirty as crap. Yeah. You know, and so that's a, also a really good argument for being against inheritance or right. taxing inheritance like crazy. Yeah, we certainly don't look at these basic structures of how property works and how wealth works um, at all closely in this country in a general way either. Because the United States, people in the United States, they don't resent it, they worship it. So. That's what I learned when, like, 
Chelsea Clinton was getting married. And I pointed out that her uh, wedding cake alone could pay for two years rent for me. Wow. (laughs) It was like a $1,500 plate reception and they were spending millions. And when I was pointing this out, people were treating me like I was jealous or something, you know, and they're like, oh, you should just let them have their special day without being so jealous and blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I mean, if you could like, cure hunger in a small third world country with the amount of wedding costs, where's the justice? I love the John Steinbeck quote that I've quoted so many times. He said that why socialism hasn't taken root in America and the United States is because Americans don't look at themselves as poor, but as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. So I love that quotation. (laughs) Oh God, I love that quote so much. And it's so true is because You know, we're told, we're conditioned from day one that, you know, if we're poor, it's our fault. Yeah. It's not the fault of the system. It's our fault because we must be lazy or stupid. Yeah. And we're not working hard enough. And we're taught, we're taught the American dream of anybody can be a Rockefeller. Right. And and another part of that, the focus on the individual and saying that we can be whatever we want to be. And if we fail, it's our fault. Another way that they play that is in terms of the environment where they put the onus on consumers right. uh, for, for changing things and, 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 you know, make sure you bring a bag to the store or change your light bulbs or whatever without looking at the, the actions of, of the large corporations or of the system itself, which is what's pushing it. I mean, because I, I know you, you, you see that there's a connection between war and militarism and the, um, and the environment, you know? Uh-huh. Right. And that's the thing. As I wrote a book in 2009 called Myth America, the 20 greatest myths of the rob- robber class and the case for revolution. Uh-huh. And one of the things I did address was this rugged individualism. You know, not only does it put the blame for everything on us, it also isolates us from Uh, true communities that could work together to solve these problems. And another thing we're also told is that we really can't solve the problems, is that they're too big. And the only thing that we can do is vote. And that's the only thing that we can do in this system. And that's really actually the one thing that's the least effective. Even these new green deals and environmental movements and stuff like that, they're constantly yelling at us. Yeah, yeah. You know? I read the whole Green New Deal when um, AOC first put it out just to see what was in there. And, and, I, and I found it disappointing because it wasn't addressing root causes for the most part. And it wasn't acknowledging other truths like the fact that, well, if you want to switch over to what they call green energy and have like these giant solar farms or whatever, that those efforts in themselves have enormous ecological impacts, you know? Right. And another thing is Bill McKibben. Who started 350? Yeah. Yeah. He wrote an article blaming us for everything because we don't have solar panels and actually like excusing the military, the U.S. military and imperialism for their part in environmental distress, saying actually the U.S. military is doing more to address this problem than anybody uh, else and to blame the U.S. military, which is a small part of the world compared to everything else, is ridiculous. So even leaders in the environmental movement are trying to steer us away from the root causes of it. But, uh, you know, apparently Bill McKibben's friend builds solar panels that the U.S. military, that the Pentagon buys. Ah, right. Because certainly Bill must know that the Pentagon is the world's largest institutional polluter. Right. And I went to this environmental march in D.C. a few years back that 350.org sponsored. And I got into several arguments with people about that. They actually told me that the military is one of the cleanest institutions in the world. Wow. So So Orwellian. Right. I mean, yeah, I guess we don't have to worry about the 700 Superfund sites that are on military land around the country. (laughs) No, or that it uses the most fossil fuels and causes more pollution than any other institution. If it was a country, it'd be number one. Right. And then the point that also is not brought up is that, of course, while the United States military is acting like such a bully stomping around on the world stage, 
keeping things destabilized, that also makes it difficult for the rest of the nations to get together and cooperate. And that's what Smedley Butler said, you know, back in the 30s, that he was a strong arm for Standard Oil. Yeah, and for the Dole Fruit Company. And, and, yeah. and yeah, yeah, I read his work. He's, he's really inspiring. And uh, it shows that in almost nothing's changed in the last hundred years. Exactly. Yeah. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Calibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Calibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... One thing I think that has gotten considerably worse over the last hundred years is the propaganda arm of the, the U.S. system, you know? Uh, right. I think that it's gotten increasingly sophisticated. You you probably know of Edward Bernays in the right. early yeah right in the early 20th century who sort of started okay. the modern uh, public relations movement, and now we're living in this uh, internet age, you know, where there's on one hand it's easier for individual voices to put themselves out there in that like an actual printing press is a very expensive thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Like like in the 70s or whatever, you couldn't just right. get a printing press and run your own newspaper. So now, you know, it's easy for people to put their own stuff out there. But there's the question of will it get noticed? Uh, who will see it? And increasingly, the large tech companies, Google, YouTube, the social media like Facebook are using algorithms to censor the content that appears there so that the small voices are not don't get the attention that they right. would otherwise, you know, right. the publication in these times just had a story out a couple of days ago that said uh, there have been 21 debate questions about paying for social programs and zero about paying for war. Right. I noticed that also. I did see that, you know, and the thing is, is that World War One, Bernays and his team, it was like the first war that got actually marketed to the American people. And now they're using that playbook over and over and over again. And so propaganda is really, you know, it's hard to wade through who's credible, who's not credible. It's hard to know who's paying for the stories. You know, you really have to research that. I guess like Mike Bloomberg is paying people to post positive things about him on social media. How's that different from, you know, what they accuse the Russians of? Really, right. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. it's just paying people to get your your point of view. So it's like democracy, information, uh, whatever, healthcare, housing, everything is education is sold to the highest bidder in this country. Prisons, whatever. It's all about profit. It's not about actual truth. It's never about truth. It's never about peace. And then when people break it down to the most important elements, those are the two most important elements that kind of get hidden under this pile of propaganda. Right, our peace and, and well, and the nature of power, basically, the source of power. Right, Right. exactly. Right. So I'm about 10 years younger than you. I was born in the, um, 69. And one thing I've noticed that I think that people who are younger haven't noticed is how much the world has changed and the world of media has changed because the first of the internet and then secondly because of the smartphones the the mobile technology i think we have more power in our pocket more computing power in our pocket than all the computers put together decades ago had it's just it's just incredible and i look at how much that has changed i was 5 when we even got a phone in my house mhm mm okay and so that was 1962. And I remember it clearly. I was so excited to get a phone. You mm -hmm. know, we were finally getting a phone. My mom used to have to go across the street to a pay phone to call my grandma or whatever. And so we had a party line. I've heard of and, those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the phone was attached to the wall. 
yep. and it had a dial. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and you if you called people, you'd get a busy signal if they were on the phone. To go from there to to where we are today, between fifty and sixty years, is mind boggling. How far we've gone. It's just you think how much further is it going to go for my grandchildren? Right. You know, like when my grandchildren are as old as me, what is the world of propaganda and uh, technology going to look like at, at that stage? Just, just and I, I think I think that's been like the biggest explosion of technology. I mean, before I was born and there was like TV was invented, radio was invented, you know, the phonograph mm-hmm. was invented and stuff like that. And now between my birth and today, it's just really, like I said, it's, it's just mind boggling how far the technology has come and how, how it's being manipulated, like you stated before, who's profiting off of it, who's uh, being oppressed because of it are really things that we have to look at. Yeah, and and something like, you know, Twitter, where people are able to report things that, that, that they're that they're seeing, like in a situation where a story is unfolding, you know, say at mm-hmm. a protest, you know, or over the course of an election day or something like during the Iowa caucuses, people were, I mean, any, pick any event you want to that's an ongoing breaking event. People are able to report what it is that they're seeing over social media. But the problem is that those aren't set up to be depositories of that kind of information. And it goes up, you see it, and then it disappears. Uh-huh. And then it's just gone, you know? So there's 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 the problem that it's owned by corporations who are going to control what we see on it. And then two, just as a medium, it's not actually good for reporting news or events or using as a tool for organizing in that way. Well, another thing is, is it's that old, old proverb about the um, blind man touching an elephant. They're, they're touching the same animal, but they have completely different perceptions of it. So say 100 people witness an event and 50 of them Twitter about it, it could be 50 different perspectives. So what actually is happening and what perspective was what is the closest to the truth in these situations. So yeah, it's very hard. And I want to say social media in my experience has um, really harmed organizing and and mobilizing people to get places. Let's talk about that a little more. Well, you know, it's like social media, I think really uh, helped Occupy Wall Street uh, get people out and stuff like that. But, you know, now's the days where I don't have to go anywhere because I can just watch the live stream or I don't have to go anywhere because I can just, you know, watch the replay or whatever. It'll be on YouTube. Right. Getting people out, mobilizing people to be at a certain place has suffered because of social media. Maybe, you know, organizing in, in uh, you know, new kinds of ways has been more successful with social media. But I don't really think that the powers that be really give a damn if we're all tweeting a hashtag. No, I don't think so either. They, they would really care if we went to Washington, D.C. and surrounded the Capitol or stopped traffic or went to Wall Street and brought guillotines or something down right. to Wall Street. I think that's what they would care about. But but the hashtag organizing, I think the powers that be just look at it and they um, realize that they've already won if that's how we're going to organize. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, unfortunately, people are now uh, forgetting the other ways of doing things uh, for not using them anymore. Like you mentioned a couple years back when um, there was an upcoming March on the Pentagon coming that you mentioned that well back in the 60s when they had marches, you know, they were able to bring a million people to D.C. through, you know, flyers, basically, mm-hmm. you know, and through announcements at church and like bulletin boards and phone trees and phone trees. Yes, of course. Phone I trees were really successful um, during that time. And how was that possible without <laughs> without Twitter or Facebook that they got uh, hundreds of thousands of people out? The first March on the Pentagon had 600,000 people. Wow. 
And so we had about 1,500. And right. we, were, we deemed ourselves very lucky to have that many people. And potentially, we reached out to millions of people really during our organizing over the course of that year, trying to get people to Washington, D.C. Right. Now, the March on the Pentagon was originally called the Women's March, March on the Pentagon, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe that, correct me if I'm wrong, that part of the original inspiration was the Women's March that happened right after at Trump's inauguration, where mm -hmm. the organizers didn't want to let anti-war voices be part of it. Exactly. The first Women's March occurred in 2017, the day after Trump's inauguration. And so there literally were millions of pe women around the world that, and people, you know, it wasn't just women, it was also men that, that marched against that. Of course, it was all anti-Trump. And so the next year, and my sister passed away that day, so I really wasn't paying that much attention to it. So the next year, I started reaching out to the organizers of the Women's March saying, you know, why don't you address war as a concern of women? And I actually was told by one of them, Cindy, we appreciate that's your issue, but it will never be our issue as long as women aren't free. And so my response was, you mean white American women are free from Trump? That's all you care about, right? <laughs> you right. don't care about you don't care about the millions of women around the world that are being oppressed by war and sanctions and other imperialist crimes. And so they just like admitted that. They just <laughs> outright admitted that. So I said, Well, you know, why can't we just organize a women's march on the Pentagon? Because it was the uh, 50th anniversary of the original March on the Pentagon. Oh, right. So we thought that that would be a good target for organizing if we wanted to organize against imperialism. And we took the women's part out basically because we were being confused with the women's march. Right. And in a negative way. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and so we're like, well, we'll just take the women's part out of it, even though we're still very forthrightly uh, a women-led organization against imperialism. Right. I mean, the the fact that, that war affects women disproportionately, I mean, that's just very real. I Yeah, it's just a real, it's just a very real fact. So these people aren't really against the systemic issues that we've been talking about today. They're just against Trump. Yeah, and... That's uh, very short-sighted and, of course, also ignored the, the previous eight years of ridiculous warmongering that happened under Obama. Well, look who they supported. They supported Hillary Clinton. She was really frightening to me. She, uh, she still is very frightening. Yeah. She's a very frightening um, war criminal, warmonger, unabashed apologist for patriarchy and imperialism. That's who they supported. And I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't supporting Biden right now just because he's not Trump. Right. Yeah. No, some of them are. Yeah, some of them are. I remember in 2016, the New York Times, of all places, was said that Hillary, of all the candidates, Democrat and Republican, was the biggest uh, war hawk, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, no offense to our Raptor friends. Who, I know. Huh? <laughs> well, that, that's a personal. They just hunt to survive. They hunt to survive. Yeah, it's yeah. a personal pet peeve because <laughs> because they're well, and they're not cruel, you know. Right. They're they're not malicious, and and mm -hmm. and generals and 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 defense contractors are those are cruel and and malicious people. I I, I feel as though uh you know when we use those kind of metaphors, animal metaphors for human beings, that one thing we're doing is ducking our own responsibility. Exactly. I try to stay away from anthropomorphizing our our hor horrible human tendencies yeah. onto these poor animals. When someone calls somebody a war pig, I'm like, what do you have against pigs? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I've <laughs> met pigs. pigs. Yeah. They don't, they don't you know, like commit war against each other, no matter what George right. Orwell wrote in Animal Farm. Yeah. You know, so a lot of people say that... <clears throat> You know, there was a statistic going around to harm Bernie Sanders. And I'm not a Bernie Sanders fan, but um, obviously he's being targeted by the establishment of the Democrat Party. 
And so they're saying that, oh, 12% of his voters, primary voters, that went and voted for Trump. I'm like, well, so what are you saying? 88% of them voted for Clinton? How's that any better? Right, right. Very few of them, I think like about 3% of them actually didn't vote or voted third party. Right. Well, because when it comes down to it, the the propaganda of both of the parties works on a lot of people, you know, it it works on the people who choose to vote anyway, you know, right. And, 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 you know, forces them to to take up the red or the blue banner. And, you know, at this point, there's at least half of people who are eligible to vote who don't vote. And of course, that's the big story. That's really who that's really that's the most significant vote in a way are the people who are voting for none of the above each time around. Right. I always say, what's a mandate when you only get a little more than, and it's not even really half, it's usually like 48% to 46%. Right. (laughs) So you get less than half of half of the eligible voters. So how does that create a mandate? I'm not sure. Right. So. Well, and then on top of that, we have a, a voting system that's, that's, that's full of irregularities and that can't really be trusted. We have the voting machines that that are electronic voting machines that don't have a paper trail. And we have lots of stories of votes being switched or votes just not being counted. Then we have, you know, uh, Greg Palast has been covering all the people who have been getting thrown off of the voter rolls through various tactics at the state level where they're like, oh, we want to make sure there aren't people from there's not one person pretending to be from two states and voting twice. You know, the whole interstate Mm. cross check thing, you know. Right. So so they've been throwing, you know. Literally, you know, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people's off the rolls all at once. And this is another um, story that almost no one pays attention to is the fact that, you know, literally millions of voters have been thrown off the, the, the rolls since 2016. So, you know, people online are like, oh, hey, look at this poll. Look, my candidate's winning. And I'll put a comment. I'm like, you know, the polls don't mean anything if the people who want to vote for your candidate can't vote. Right. And that's what we're or seeing. They, or if they do vote and their votes aren't counted. And yeah. look at all these people today, super, well, at the time of our, our taping, right. our recording, today, it's, it's Super Tuesday. Tuesday. Mm-hmm. And um, Klobuchar and Buttigieg dropped out. Right. And so what happens to all those people who pre-voted for them? What happens to right. all their votes? Or right. all the mail-in votes for them. They're not going to be counted. Better right. luck next time. Whoops. <laughs> you nope. know, you just cast your meaningless vote in a system that is compromised. Well, Calibri, I'm running out of time um, now. So so did you just want to let us know about uh, where to find your, your, your stuff? So Cindy Sheehan Soapbox is my podcast. It's been going since January 2009. That can be found. Just Google Cindy Sheehan Soapbox or whatever you know, Google's just like a generic term, whatever right. search engine you use. Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. And then March on the Pentagon is marchonpentagon.com. Um, we're organizing for our, our event in October again. But we also do many community conference calls, chats, live chats, and um, things like that to discuss imperialism, especially and current events, especially that apply to U.S. imperialism. Well, thanks so much for talking to me today, Cindy. I've been an admirer of yours since the days of Camp Casey, and so it was really a, a pleasure to have a conversation with you today. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be on your new show. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.